Good morning and welcome to the New Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church located here in the Mott's community of Smith Station, Alabama. We're excited about today and about the message that's going to come forth today. But for those of us that are here in Alabama, those that are here in the South, Next Saturday marks the beginning of a special time in the South, and that is SEC football. So today I have on my Auburn University attire, I'm a proud alumni along with my, my son and my twin daughters, and my wife has been working there over 20 years. We are proud to be Auburn Tigers and are looking forward to the game on next week. With this pandemic, of course, there's been not been a lot of fun in games. So we are looking for something to help lift our spirits. But guess what? I'm so glad we have Jesus who is always there to lift us up in our time of need. I'm so glad that right now he's working behind the scenes to make sure we are protected and that we stay blessed. I want you to know that I love you. I thank you all for joining us today and enjoy the service. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to New Jerusalem. Good morning, children. It's Minister Freeman Booker and Sydney coming to you with another word of encouragement. Uh, this morning's message is coming from Matthew chapter 8, verses 21 through 35. Um, and Sid is going to read a small portion of that. And we're going to talk about the parable of the unforgiving servant and the lesson we can learn from it. Okay? Sid, would you read that uh, first, uh, the key verse for us, please? Verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seven times seven times. That's 70 times seven. So how many times is that, Sid? 70 times seven. How many times is that? 490. 409. That's a lot of times. And the story, the parable uh, that Jesus is referring to was about a king, um, a servant that owed the king a large debt and a servant that owed the servant a small debt. Okay. It's three people, key people in this parable. And what happened was the king wanted to settle all his accounts. So he canceled all the debts of the first servant. He canceled the debt of the first servant. What the first servant did was he was very harsh with the person that owed him. Okay? You understand? And instead of forgiving the debt like the king had done for him. So what Jesus is saying to us 
in this message is, you know, it, it, it's, it's for us to understand that Jesus is our king and he paid our sin debt by allowing Jesus to die for our sins on the cross, right? And we should follow the example of Jesus. So when someone hurts us or does wrong by us, we should cancel their debt so they don't owe us anything, right? And we should treat people the way that Jesus treats us, right? And how does Jesus treat us? Good. Yeah, he loves us, right? And in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love keeps no record of wrong. So when, I, when the, that number, that 490, that's a lot of times to forgive someone, right? Mm -hmm. But what he's not saying, we supposed to be keeping the tally. He's saying one time, forgive one time. But what he's saying is forgiveness should be something that's endless. Just like Jesus canceled our sin debt by dying on the cross for us, we should have that same attitude when someone hurts us, meaning we're going to cancel their debt. They don't owe us anything, but we're going to forgive them and love them anyway, despite what they've done, right? And so that's the message that this parable teaches us, to love the way that Jesus loves us, to not dishonor others or be easily angry and keeping a record of wrongs, but to love and forgive the way that Jesus, that, that, that we're forgiven on a regular basis. Because we all fall short, right? Amen? So, the 490 is a lot of times to remind you to forgive numerous times. All right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for loving us, God. Thank you for blessing us, God. Thank you for covering us in our, in our weakest times, God, and when we've hurt others and, and hurt you, God, that you forgive us, God, and send us a great example in Jesus. Thank you for that example of endless love, God, and endless forgiveness, God. May we follow that example in our daily lives, God, and apply the lesson we've learned uh, in our walk, in our daily walk. And I pray this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. You guys be blessed. Continue to love and forgive others. None on earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Oh, 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 to God's unchanging hand. Trust. In him who will not leave you. Oh, what sun ever years may bring. If your earthly friends desert you, oh, still more closely to him cling. Come on, everybody ought to hold to his hand. You know God's unchanging hand. Come on and hold to his hand. You know God's unchanging hand. You ought to feel your hopes on things eternal. Oh, 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 hold on to God. Unchanging hand. Oh, everybody ought to hold to his hand. You know God's unchanging hand. Why don't you hold to his hand? God's unchanging hand. You ought to be your hopes on things eternal. Hold, hold on to God's unchanging hand. Come on, one more time. Whoa, everybody ought to hold to his hand. You know God's unchanging hand. Somebody ought to hold to his hand. You know God's unchanging hand. You ought to feel your hopes 
on things eternal. Oh, hold on to God's unchanging hand. Yeah, hallelujah. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. When I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You're the fire and light when nights are long and cold. In sadness, you are the laughter that shatters all my fears. When I'm all alone, your hand is there to hold. Oh, 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 Jesus, you're the center of my joy. And all that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. Hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. You are why I find pleasure in the simple things in life. You're the music in the meadows and the streams, the voices of the children, my family and my home, you're the source and finish of my highest dreams. Whoa. You're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Oh, Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Jesus, you are the center. Of my joy, you are everything, my everything, everything, Lord, everything. You're my joy in my sorrow, you're my hope for tomorrow, you're the lifter of my head. You're my music, Jesus, when you're my song. You're 
Corinthians chapter 12 verses 7 through 10 reading from the New King James Version there is a word from the Lord that says lest I should be exalted of a measure by the abundance of the revelations a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure concerning this thing I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's Say, for when I am weak, then I am strong. From this passage of scripture, I just want to say I'm weak. I'm weak. I was an academic counselor for Auburn University Athletics. When I first began hearing some of my student athletes use the term, I'm weak. But initially, I didn't understand their slang. You know, I'm old school. To be weak means that you are lacking in strength. You're not strong. You're powerless. Eventually, though, I began hearing my daughters use the same term and figured out from its context what they were saying. I'm weak to young people is a description of what is experienced when you are so overcome with laughter that your body is in a temporary state of weakness. All of us have experienced it before. The weakness that comes when you're laughing so hard at something that is so funny that you can hardly catch your breath. You become weak and unable to do anything but laugh. Sometimes you even begin gasping for air. The laughter makes you weak. Hence, I'm weak. This is a good, happy kind of weakness. But in our lives, there is another kind of weakness that we all experience that Paul refers to in our text. This weakness stems from our inability to overcome something because it has some kind of power over us. When we have a vice, many times we refer to the vice as our weakness. For instance, sweets are my weakness. I love cakes, pies, cookies, ice cream, cobblers, puddings, and other sweet treats. When I make up my mind to lose weight, it is the sweets that are my weakness. Lest I'm really focused and committed, they become a thorn in my side. This thorn in my side phrase has biblical roots even before Paul. In Numbers chapter 33, God gives Moses instructions for the Hebrews to conquer the land of Canaan. In the instructions, God tells them that they are to drive out all of the inhabitants of the land, destroy all of their engraved stones, destroy all of their molded images, and demolish all of their high places so that the land could become their possession. With these instructions, however, God also issues a warning. 
He says, but if you do not drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall become irritants in your eyes and thorns in your side, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. Now, brothers and sisters, some of y'all are having that problem right now. You have a thorn in your side because you didn't get rid of something that God told you to get rid of. You should have dismissed, dismissed that zero you're with and let God send you a new bay. Now you're they're a thorn in your side. You should have found some new friends and gotten rid of those haters who never had your back and are always putting you down. Now they're a thorn in your side. God will sometimes tell you to get rid of some stuff in your life before he can elevate you to the rightful place of blessing. And if you don't do it, they will become a thorn in your side. Have I got a witness in this place? In our text, the apostle Paul also uses this phrase by declaring that he was given a thorn in his flesh. The origin or cause of Paul's thorn in the flesh is not revealed, although there have been many speculations. Could have been his circumstances that he was talking about. It could have been an unknown sin that he had trouble dealing with. It could have been just about anything. But the important thing to note is that something bothered Paul to the point that he asked God three times to remove it from his flesh. Paul understood that the thorn was a weakness for him, but he did not let it stop him from doing the Lord's work. So today I want to encourage us who are on this journey for the Lord. We may have thorns in our side and God may not remove our thorns, but we have the opportunity to do great things in spite of our weaknesses. So don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Admit your issues and tell somebody right now, I'm weak. First of all, brothers and sisters, you must know that your thorn in the flesh is not to hurt you, but to humble you. We experience many difficulties in our lives, trials and tribulations, heartaches and heartbreaks, sickness and distress, pain and suffering, grief and anguish, anxiety and depression, the ups and downs of living this life that we live. But most of our experiences are not to hurt us, but to humble us so that we can become stronger. They do not have a permanent effect on us. Our text says that they are to keep us from exalting ourselves before measure. In other words, to keep us from getting the big head. You can't humble yourself. You can't be humble if you have the big head. And you know, humility goes a long way before God. Second Chronicles 714 starts off by saying, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. As people, you know, we are too prideful and often we approach God just like we approach everything else in a prideful manner. The Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Haughtiness is pride that's just simply gone bad. It's when you become selfishly arrogant and think extremely highly of yourself. When you are haughty, you have no respect for anyone else but yourself. There is zero humility. You can't approach God that way. God says if we humble ourselves and pray. So we must humble ourselves before we even talk to him. That's not a personal choice, it's a requirement. He's not one of the boys or one of the girls that we can approach him in any kind of manner and talk to him any old kind of way. We must humble ourselves and then pray. We must humble ourselves before seeking his help. 
before seeking his guidance, before seeking his permission, before seeking his healing, before seeking his deliverance, before seeking his breakthrough, before seeking his presence, before seeking his blessing, before seeking his faith, we must humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways. Yes, you have some wicked ways. You may as well admit it. I have some wicked ways too. We may be saved, but we're not perfect. The Bible says there are none that are righteous, no, not one. There are none that are good, no, not one. For all, not some, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are no little U's and big I's or big U's and little I's. We are all equally wicked. Bible says the flesh is sinful. Romans 8, 3 says that Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin that he might condemn sin in the flesh. We are all sinful by nature. We are all evil by nature. We are all wicked by nature. But somebody ought to say, God, thank you for the grace. For with the assistance of grace, we can obtain honor. Before honor is humility. Proverbs 18, 12 says, Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. You can't expect God to allow honor to come your way if you are not ready or prepared to receive it. So we must humble ourselves before God and before our fellow man. Some of y'all put on an act trying to make people think that you're so righteous, so close to God, and so humble before God, but then you treat everybody else like they're beneath you. You better uh, stop playing with God. God knows your heart. Luke 16, 15 from the New Living Translation says, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your heart. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. In other words, you must humble yourselves before God if you expect God to bless you. Can I get a witness in this place? Next, brothers and sisters, your weakness does not make you a weakling. Your weakness does not make you a weakling. A weakling is a person or animal that is physically weak or frail. The key word here is physically. When I was growing up, there used to be advertisements for a company called the Jowett Institute. They were in newspapers, magazines, and comic books. Some of you over 50 may remember the ads. The ad showed a picture of a little skinny guy on the beach who would always be standing in the shadow of this huge muscle-laden guy with a beautiful girl in his arms. The ad said, stop being a skinny weakling like I was, and in 10 minutes of fun a day, you can do all that I did. Gain 25 pounds of handsome muscle-packed muscles all over. Improve your He-Man look 1,000%. Win new strength and win new popularity. So if you didn't want to be a physical weakling, you had to mail in your request and they would send you a bodybuilding and nutrition plan that focused on using body weight and plate loading dumbbells. Then you would no longer get pushed around or have sand kicked in your face while you were on the beach. But brothers and sisters, having a weakness is different than being a weakling. Even if you were to get all of the muscles of The Rock, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and the Hulk combined, you would still be susceptible to having a weakness. A weakness is a state or condition of lacking strength. It is a quality or feature regarded as a disadvantage or fault. Under this definition, my weakness would be my compassion. I have a genuine compassion for people and to help people. And because of that, I sometimes let my guard down 
around people who mean to do me harm. But thank God I'm covered by the blood. It is also a person or thing that one is unable to resist or likes excessively. Now, if I had to choose something from this category, I think Sister Davis would be my weakness. She's my kryptonite. If I have it and she wants it, it's a done deal. I can tell my children no. I can tell my grandchildren no. I have the power and ability to refuse their request. But Sister Davis, that sweet chocolate piece of love, she is my weakness. Further, a weakness is a self-indulgent liking for something. As stated earlier, I love some sweets. I love key lime cake and cheesecake and sweet potato pie and cheese danish and chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Enough said. Bottom line, we are all plagued with weaknesses. I have mine and you have yours too. Even a lion, the king of the jungle, has weaknesses. As strong, powerful, and fast as the lion is, it has a weakness that can be exploited by other animals. Other animals can hit the lion with their hooves. There are videos of a lion being killed by a giraffe, no less. The lion was vulnerable to the powerful kicks of the giraffe who used the lion's weakness to kill it. But understand, your weaknesses do not make you a weakling. You are not powerless because of your weakness. You are not helpless because you have a weakness. You should not be discouraged because you have a weakness. In our text, the Lord says that my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Your weakness perfects God's strength in you. What you don't have, God has it for you. He has the strength you need to make it through times of despair. He has the strength you need to deal with people you know don't like you. He has the strength you need to make it through sickness and distress. He's there for better and for worse. Where you are lacking, God's grace is sufficient. Many of us don't realize that we have all that we need at our disposal because God is all we need. Jesus is all we need. The Holy Spirit is all we need. If you can't be provided for by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, then we don't need what it is that we think we need. His grace is sufficient to supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. Have I got a witness in this place? Finally, brothers and sisters, your strength is a result of your weakness. A bodybuilder develops balance in their strength and physique by focusing on areas that are his or her weakness. A person would look funny with skinny arms that don't complement a huge muscular upper body with a big old chest and muscular legs. A person would look ridiculous with skinny legs holding up a massive muscular structure above the waist. Therefore, for a balanced look, a person can not only focus on their areas of strength, they must also give attention to their areas of weakness. We can't get strong in our areas of weakness without putting some emphasis and focus on those areas. If your weakness is managing your finances, you can't get strong in that area without systematically putting some focus in that area. If your weakness is drinking or smoking, you can't overcome that addiction without putting some real work in and focusing on making a change in that area. If your weakness is sin, you can't conquer the sin unless you face it and commit to changing what you do. If we want to strengthen our areas of weakness, we have to work on them. 
Your weakness does not have to be your Achilles heel. But it may, however, still be a thorn in your side. That means that it may resurface from time to time and never really go away. It may become so nagging that you have to continually ask God, just like Paul, to remove it from you. It may become a pestilence that drives you crazy because of its persistence. But my brothers and sisters, I want you to count it all joy. Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Take pleasure in your health issues. God is making you stronger. Take pleasure in your financial woes. God is making you stronger. Take pleasure in your relationship problems. God is making you stronger. For when you are weak, God makes you strong. As I get ready to leave you, I want you to embrace your weaknesses today. They are what make you strong. When you are weak, God can make you strong. And you become strong because of God's sufficient grace. That means he has enough grace to go around. Nobody has a patent or copyright on God's grace. You, can't rece you can receive it and use it freely. You are a survivor because God strengthened you with his grace. You are an overcomer because God gave you strength through grace. You are a winner because God gave you the victory through grace. His grace is ample. His grace is abundant. His grace is sufficient. So don't put so much negative emphasis on what you don't have. Stop focusing on the disappointing and challenging things in your life as something negative and focus on them as a stepping stone to your greater. You can't reach greater if you don't know what lesser is all about. You won't appreciate where God is taking you if you haven't been through something to get there. That's why God, Jesus, came down through 42 generations to save us here on earth. He had to get a firsthand experience of what we go through. He had to experience the pain and the anguish. He had to experience the heartbreak and the betrayal. He had to experience the abandonment and the rejection by those who said they love him. He had to experience the suffering and the ridicule. But even while here on earth, he never let the negative negate him. He never let deceit dissolve him. He never let dislike dissuade him. He never let pain punish him. He refused to let ridicule rob him. He didn't let heartache hurt him. He didn't let rejection recuse him. But what, did, but what he did was lay down his life for us. He died on Calvary's cross and through his death, through his humility, through his perseverance, he was made perfect in his own weakness. And now he has risen from the grave with all power in his hand. It is with that power, the power of the almighty God, that we are made strong in our weakness. So brothers and sisters, say to yourself, I'm weak, but God shall make me strong. May God bless you. And may God forever keep you.